So Robin Morgan is an employee at a Taco Bell franchise. And what her employer does is they, they rig people's time so that even if you work extra hours beyond the 40 hours a week, so you work overtime and they should pay you for the overtime, what they do is they sort of move those hours to another week. And so what it really is, is it's wage theft. It's violating the wage and hour laws. So Robin Morgan uh, finds a lawyer, discovers this is violating her legal rights, and she brings what's called a collective action, which is a case on behalf of her and all the other workers at the set of Taco Bells who are treated the same way. So then what happened is, then there's a forced arbitration clause. But here's how it comes up in this case. This, and this is a common thing. So what um, Sundance does, and Sundance is this company that owns a bunch of different Taco Bell franchises through the Midwest. Sundance decides to try and litigate the case in court for a while first and see how that goes. And so they litigate in court for a while, they look at settling the case, they file a motion asking the court to resolve the case and so forth. Case litigate goes forward in court for most of a year. And then they decide it's not going that well and they don't like being in court and they worry about the judge. And they decide instead what they're gonna do is they're going to try and invoke the arbitration clause. And so now what's happening here is um, the right to go to arbitration is a part of a contract. So when two people agree to things, there's a bunch of agreements in the contract and it goes back and forth between them. And so there are all these different cases in America where people have a right under a contract and they decide they don't want to involve it. You don't have to do everything in the contract. And lots of times what happens is people walk away from a part of the contract that they don't really want to do. And it's up to the other side to sort of hold them to it. And so what courts have done in all sorts of different settings to say, well, they waived their rights under the contract. So if you have a right under a contract and you do something that's inconsistent with that right, you sort of do something that is counter to that right, courts will say, well, you waived your right to a contract. So what happens here is that the trial court finds that Sundance waived its right to contract uh, arbitration, they waived the right to arbitration by going to court and litigating in court. And then it goes to the court of appeals and they say, well, they did waive their rights. They acted inconsistently with it. But um, you have to prove, the plaintiff, Ms. Ms. Um, uh, Morgan, has to prove that she was prejudiced, which really usually means well, probably that she lost some kind of money because they litigated in court instead of arbitration. And so where this is coming from is the whole thing about arbitration clauses stems back to 1925. And in 1925, Congress passed this statute, the Federal Arbitration Act. And so the Federal Arbitration Act has got a bunch of different provisions, but the main part of it is a single sec single sentence, just one sentence, section two of the act, and it's got all the sort of substantive rules. And basically what it says is that arbitration clauses are supposed to be as good as other contracts, but not more so. And what was happening was is that in the early 1920s, you know, uh, shipping companies and so forth wanted to go out of arbitration and courts wouldn't enforce the contracts because it was taking cases away from the courts and the courts are sort of jealous of their power. So Congress wanted to say, okay, well, you can't do that. You can't discriminate against arbitration clauses. They're just as good as other contracts. But what happened with this waiver thing is, is that you can waive a right all the time and you don't have to show and the other, the party who's saying, hey, you waived your right, you blew it. They don't have to show prejudice for any other contract right. And so what the Court of Appeals did here is they came up with a special rule that says, if you waive your right under an arbitration clause, you have to show prejudice, where that's not the rule for any other type of contract. And so going back to the idea the Supreme Court said that the Arbitration Act is only supposed to be make arbitration clauses as good as other contracts, but not more so, that's not what they're doing. And so, you know, a bunch of the conservatives on the court have been saying for years, you know, well, you know, it's the liberals on the court who make up these rules of law and they, they say things that aren't really in the language of the statute. And you should always look at the text of a statute. And Justice Kagan, you know, one of the more progressive members of the court had said a couple of years ago, we are all textualists now. I mean, we all look at the text, the language of a statute. And so our question to the Supreme Court is, where did you come up with this idea that you have to show prejudice for an arbitration clause when you don't have to show it for any other type of contract right? Why is there this special rule for arbitration when there's nothing about waiver, prejudice, or any of that in the one sentence that's a substantive part of this statute? So that's really what the fight was about in the Supreme Court. Our argument is that Sundance is trying to find some complicated rule of law 
in this 1925 statute when it's not in the language. And one of the things that's really striking in the Supreme Court argument is that Paul Clement, who's arguing on behalf of Sundance, is up there making up these rules of law as to why there's a prejudice requirement for arbitration clauses when there isn't a prejudice requirement for waiver of any other contract, right? And Justice Kagan calls him short and she says, you know, this sounds like it's pretty made up. You're making this up. And I think that's exactly right. It seems a bit made up, this definition of default that you have. I mean, you say that there are certain things that count as default, missing an explicit deadline. Um, and, and But, you know, where are we getting this from? We're not getting it from Section 4. We're not getting it from any other part of the FAA. Where does this federal common law rule come from as to what counts as default? One of the things that's striking about this case is that the other side is really playing games, right? Sundance, they start off in court, they litigate in court for most of a year, and then they decide it's not going out that well, so they decide to change sides, and now they decide to send their, in their advantage to uh, go to arbitration. Well, that's really jerking around the federal court. It's wasting the time of a federal judge um, in Iowa in this case by making him hear a bunch of stuff in the case and have hearings and read briefs and read papers. And then they're going to say, you know, judge, we don't really like you that much. We're going to go to arbitration instead. And so Justice Sotomayor really helped explain why it is that what Sundance was doing here was playing games and they're abusing their power of the court. Mr. Clement, the problem I have with your answer for Justice Breyer is that the essence of the agreement here is to uh, not be in litigation. Now, you can argue the petitioner by filing a claim in court, she herself has waived it. So the fact that I waive it just evens out. I understand that argument. But the question becomes, did you know that you had the right to arbitration? And here you knew. Nevertheless, you didn't move for arbitration in the answer as a defense. You made a motion to transfer the case. When that motion was denied, you indicated the willingness to continue in litigation and went into settlement talks, and actually there were materials produced. By its nature, there was a delay in the speedy adjudication of the case because you didn't move to begin with to go to arbitration. So that's delay, something that that was uh, negotiated for. And the cost is the cost that Justice Kavanaugh said, an unnecessary motion, an unnecessary type of settlement agreement. Um, Arbitration settlement agreements rarely require the production of materials. They just require talking. So having said all of that to you, the reason you waited was because you wanted to see how the court, by your own admission, you wanted to wait to see if the court was going to approve of class actions in arbitration. So you were taking a calculated risk by staying in litigation. Why isn't that a waiver under Section 6? Why isn't that a waiver under any normal definition. It prejudiced the other side. It hurt them, at least financially. It hurt them in delay. And you intentionally sat on your rights, waiting to see if you could derive a benefit. So So explain to unpackage it, but tell me why is not that not a waiver as an intentional right of an intentional relinquishment of a known right? Carla Gilbride's argument was flat out fantastic, is one of the best oral arguments I've ever seen in the Supreme Court. She had the most important points right at her fingertips. She had a complete command of all of the case law. So she had a command of all the law. She had a complete command of the facts. She knew a very complicated set of laws from federal courts, from state courts, from cases in the 1800s, the cases decided a few months ago throughout the country. It was really a tour de force. And I think it's going to be, I think it was one of the best uh, oral arguments that I've seen in the Supreme Court in having seen more than 100 of them over 20 years. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. Section 2 of the Federal Arbitration Act requires that an agreement to arbitrate be enforced 
unless a generally applicable contract defense renders it unenforceable. But the Eighth Circuit didn't apply a generally applicable contract defense here. It applied an arbitration-specific waiver defense that requires the person asserting waiver to prove prejudice, even though prejudice isn't required to establish waiver of other contractual rights in Iowa. That's what the Eighth Circuit did wrong, and that's why we're here. It should have assessed Robin Morgan's waiver defense under generally applicable Iowa law to determine if there was an enforceable contract on which the procedural provisions of the FAA could operate. If it found waiver under state law, that would have been the end of the inquiry. Sundance intentionally relinquished its contractual arbitration rights by asking a federal judge to dismiss this case and filing an answer that didn't mention arbitration. Those actions should have been sufficient for a finding of waiver, and the same actions placed Sundance in default within the meaning of Section 3. Prejudice has no part to play in either of these inquiries, and the Eighth Circuit was wrong to require it. So we argue that arbitration clauses are supposed to be as good as other contracts, but not better. And one of the things that's happened is that sort of pro-corporation courts have increasingly invented all sorts of rules that favor arbitration clauses, make them like they're super contracts, better than any other kind of contract. And that's been a terrible thing for workers, for consumers, for people who go into nursing homes and other people who are harmed by these arbitration clauses. And so if the court will just stick to the principle and say, these arbitration clauses can't be treated better than other types of contracts, that will be a huge victory for workers and consumers.